You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And welcome back to the Sheelan Show, folks. It's Andy Polk. Thanks for joining me on uh, this episode. A new episode drops every Monday. Remember that. Hope you subscribe. Uh, as we hit into 2024, we're really trying to talk to different folks across the industry on their perspectives of, of what they think in terms of consumers, in terms of the economy, in terms of just operations. It seems like we're hitting an inflection point in our industry where we're becoming a little bit more conservative because of economic conditions and trying to figure out how much money consumers actually have versus how much they're actually in debt, et cetera. So we have these conversations, try to help kind of pinpoint from different perspectives and try to give us a better picture. I'm really excited today to have my good friend, John Aaron on. John is not a stranger to Shoe and he's been on, I don't know, maybe five times. I feel like maybe the green jacket or something. There's got to be something once you hit five. That you five get. time club, the five timers yeah. club. Went, there you go, the five timers club. But what's interesting about John is it's a homecoming episode, not just for Shoe in but uh, John is, is president of the Born Brands Group at Berkshire Hathaway shoe company. And that's initially, John, where I met you. You were working at, at Berkshire Hathaway Shoes in different capacities. Over the last five years, you've gone on this kind of footwear journey. So let's just talk about that. Uh, it's First of all, it's great to see you. How are you doing? Doing well. I think this is great. This is the first time I've been on the show without Matt. And this is what you and I always talk about behind the scenes about us taking over and Matt's off in Vietnam or wherever. So this is awesome. Um, <laughs> I know I'm well. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, exactly. It's coming together. Finally. finally. Moment. Let's not screw this up. All right. Um, we'll try to be professional, uh, professional as we can be. John, you, you were at Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, and then all of a sudden you had a unique opportunity to take over Fanny. And this is a good opportunity too, because FDRA now runs Fanny, but we can talk about how that came about. And then, sure. and, and I think too, it's important for people to understand Fanny as a marketplace, the importance of it. Maybe you can just share your perspective. Yeah, I joined Born in 2002 as a, a salesperson on the West Coast, and I had a, uh, I was there through 2018 and had a great 16-year run. And like with any run, I think you know, there's always differences of opinions, difference of changes. In 2018, I, I left H. Brown at the time, now Berkshire Hathaway Shoe Holdings, as you, as you mentioned. Um, and it was a traumatic moment in my career, quite frankly. And the interesting part about it is that the person that Jim Isler, who I've maintained a, a close relationship throughout, recommended me for the Fanny role that Ron Fromm was rolling off of. And it was a real inflection point at Fanny. Fanny was trying to, with everything else, as, as customers consolidated and department stores, uh, Fanny was traditionally at, at all the department stores and the big major players from around the world would come to New York right. uh, four times a year. Um, and it, it was a just a, a flagpole organization in our industry for so many years. And it was changing. The revenue structure was changing. There's a lot of things changing. So I came in at an inflection point in 2018 and we were starting to institute some changes and, and quite frankly, trying to become an, a trade association that provided information and provided services to the industry, not just held a trade show and emulating what you and Matt have developed in FDRA. And the amount of content and the amount of services that you offer to the industry were unmatched. And so when COVID happened, there was always an underlying talk about Fannie and FDRA merging. And COVID was just an accelerant for that. It made sense. Mm -hmm. You and Matt and I had known each other. Obviously, Ron Fromm and some other board members were shared on both horns of FDRA and Fannie. And so it really came together quickly. And it was a real proud moment in my career to put that together. And I'm proud of the job that you guys have done. Specifically, Sandy Mines took my role and mm -hmm. she's she's turned it into 3X. Really happy with with everything that's gone down. And I, I in fact, I was going through, still, I have some old files in my office and nostalgically paging through some of the old <laughs> Fanny stuff that I, I need to get into Sandy's hands. But there's a whole cache of information from the Fanny archives that yes, I still, and I, I still um, have. But um, right. One thing of particular interest, one thing of particular interest to you for Fanny is we have people who may not understand the New York market and how it works. It's not under one roof. Um, some people will opine, well, it's a lot of work because I got to go from showroom to showroom. But I also think there's 
a lot of vibrancy around that of, of being able to have these brands do more storytelling in their own showrooms than absolutely a, 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 a benign Look, booth somewhere. You know, again, Fanny was a collection of New York shoe companies that came together and said, Hey guys, this is back when it started in the eighties, we've got to align so that we're inviting all the retailers in on common dates because mm-hmm. everybody has slightly different product development and sales calendars. Mm-hmm. And it, and way back then there was a couple national shows, but the New York shoe company said, Hey, we are a powerful entity if we're together. And so we've got to align and make sure that our dates make sense for each other. And so that all the retailers in America could come to New York, the, the Mecca of American retail on a co- coordinated basis. And that was what birthed Fanny in the eighties. And that principle is still the guiding principle for the organization today is, Hey, let's set dates. And that's what we do. Fanny sets dates that everyone comes on coordinated times. And you're right. I look at it as a, we have our showroom in New York city. I look at it as a home game. Mm-hmm. I get to set the presence. I get to put pictures on the wall that represent my brand. I get to merchandise my shoes in, not out of a suitcase at a show somewhere, but it's a home game, if mm-hmm. you will. And they come in and you get two hours with the leaders of America's biggest and, um, most vibrant retailers to tell them your story and to sell them on why they should invest in your product. And so it's a huge advantage to have that showroom, to have that space. And then again, Fanny then, when it was at its peak, had the Hilton Hotel was right. thriving with, sh- with conference rooms, with hotel rooms, with some of the, the smaller players and, and major players. I mean, Skechers was the biggest, the, the biggest partner of Fanny for 10 years mm-hmm. in a showroom in the Hilton. And then that changed into what you guys are now doing in which we started with the, um, the pop-up where, you know, again, I know Burke has to access sketch, not Skechers, Skechers has their own showroom now, but there's plenty of great companies that, that now come in once a year or twice a year and you guys coordinate their efforts. So I think it's, it's still for me, I said it earlier, but it's a stakeholding event for us. We look at, especially our June and December fannies at Camuto. It was when I was at, I, I went after Fanny, I went to uh, DBI, the Camuto group for a bit. It was almost like the Feb and the August shows were as important, maybe a little bit more important for the fashion companies. We're more comfort-based. December and June is a bigger deal for us, whereas Mm -hmm. the true spring and true fall were really presented at the the Feb and August shows. So they're all important. It's just, I think different companies use the weeks differently. I see. That's very interesting. Let's talk about DBI really quickly. After you saved Fanny and help it transition a little bit and kept it going and moved it over from where it was to FDRA, you joined DBI and that seemed like a very interesting opportunity. And I should say too, your journey is really unique too, because I think you worked at, at Nike as well. So you have athletic comfort, but with yeah. DBI move there with the Camuto group, maybe you can just share your journey through that because again, sure. you were running your room in New York, different product, different company. What did you learn and, and gain from working, working with them for a few years? Yeah. Debbie Ferre, who was, I was very close with because I had a relationship with her selling her shoes at DSW. And then she was on the Fanny board. They were looking for someone to join their brand group and be the sales manager for the Lucky brand. And so I did that for two and a half years, I think. And it was wonderful. It was great. I had a ton of respect for that organization. I think the thing that I learned really quickly and has influenced me and impacted me is the amount of talented and smart and successful women that, 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 that run that company, whether it starts with Debbie, but Geraldine Lyman and Sinithia Ali and Kelly Wilson and Melissa Lawrence at the time, there was just a Marlene Eaton. There was a ton of women that I worked with that are the future of women are the future of our industry. And sure. you look back at the only, the old Fanny catalog, it's a bunch of men sitting around banquet tables. And that was my biggest impact of Kamuna was that I went from being the majority of, we had HH Brown for so many years of male dominated business to right. female dominated business. And it was a huge learning inflection point for me because the talent level, the perspective gained a ton of respect for the people I worked with and worked for, and that influenced me. It, it's impacted me greatly, but just learning a different way of doing like that much more fashion oriented than a comfort company is Vince Camuto, Jessica Simpson, a great brand, much more integrated in how they make product for their own stores. So it was a great learning experience for me. I had a, I can't say anything but great things about my time at Komodo. I was really impressed with that group of people that I worked with. 
and then back to Bourne. You've been to how how long have you been back at Bourne Brain Group now? Maybe a year. Well, yeah. uh, I came back in July, uh, a little over half a year. Again, feels like yeah. You know what? An opportunity. I, I live in Connecticut. Their headquarters are in in Greenwich. This is going to sound weird, but I'm an office guy. I yeah. like going into the office. Not I enjoyed my time in the work from home environment, but I thrive in a culture. I thrive creating a culture, I think. And the opportunity felt like coming home. And so I, I took it. And so yeah. I'm back here. It's 15 minutes from my house. We have a show in New York. So I go to the show. The show I go to New York once a week, once every four, five, four or five times a month, depending on the time of the year. But we have offices in Greenwich, which is fun to be back. Yeah. From, from a leadership perspective, it's a lot easier and more effective to yell at someone face to face than over Zoom. So I, I agree with that 100%. I kid. This is what we yeah, do. Yeah. No, I, I try not to do that. Tell me about the Born Brand Group. So it's Comfort Footwear. And I, obviously, I, th I think people know Berkshire Hathaway and, and Jim Missler, and, and many people know you. But when you come back to the Born Brand Group, are we going to, are, are you looking at changing product? Are you looking at changing operations? What do you, when you, when you came back to the Born Brand Group, what are you looking to do to optimize and re engage, re emerge the yeah, brand? It's it's really simple. We Born was a brand that was created in the mid nineties by Jim Isler and Tom McClaskey. Tom was our creative director and president for 30 years. He retired last, he retired. They, the reason they brought me back was because Tom was planned for, to retire. And so it's a real simple mandate for me is to bridge the next generation of the brand. Uh, Tom led us for 30 years. He was an incredible creative. He led the product. I'm not a product president the same way Tom was. I'm leaning really heavily into our product development group. There's a woman by the name of Francesca White that's leading us now from a creative standpoint who's incredible. And so really it's regenerating and, and keeping keeping the brand going, keeping the, setting up a new era for the brand after Tom's retirement. So that was the opportunity. That's what we're in the middle of doing. And it's exciting. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Tell me about workforce. We did a innovation survey across the industry. It was really interesting. Obviously, everyone from an innovator standpoint is, is very concerned about product because product is king. It drives everything. What was showing up in some of the survey stuff was that just a concern about a generational shift in our industry around workers uh, and knowledge and skills. Um, over the last couple of years, fr from your different purges, how do you feel like our workforce is in terms of Obviously, there's always a churn, but are we getting the folks coming in? Like, how would you judge them? Are they good shoe people? Or is there a need to skill up the industry better in certain areas? Like, how do you judge the the current workforce that we have in our, our footwear industry? It's a tough question, but yeah, I know it's a bunch of different perspectives. Look, again, when I came into the industry, there was a real hierarchy and a rhythm to it, and it was really slow moving. And yeah. You started on the tech force, you went to an independent sales group, you sold independence. And then if you were good at selling independence, you might've got mid-majors. Mm -hmm. If you're good at mid-majors, you, you might've got department stores mm -hmm. and you had planners and you had salespeople. So there was a real hierarchy for the it. sales organization anyway. And there was a real formality to designing to that hierarchy. That's out the window now. I think they're, it, the independents are still a, a vibrant, in, important group of customers. There's just a lot less of them. Yeah. And quite frankly, there's different rules for different brand groups. Again, I read where Kitty Bollinger at Dansko said something where someone asked her a question about, um, if you're not on Hoka or Birkenstock, you can't tell me you had a good year last year. And I buy into what she said. I agree with her. It's hard. It's hard to say, yeah, we had a great 2023 because it was a tough year. And again, it, we were a, an industry that in, in, especially the comfort zone were dominated by four or five players that had different rules. They're, they have different performance levels. Good for them. We try hard every day to compete with them. But getting back to your question about workforce, different. it's a different landscape because there's so much more digital. Like you need to be digital sa digitally savvy and worrying about your web business so much more today than you ever had to 10 years ago. You have to be so much more concerned about competitive pricing in the industry than you did, had to 10 years ago because everything is so much more transparent. Mm -hmm. So it's a different skill set. And and the true shoe dog is sometimes lost in that, but the ability to understand the process and understand what it takes to design, develop, and commercialize shoes, that's what, going back to, I, I sometimes come to meetings and I go, wait a minute, they have no idea. And I really enjoy that. I'm at the, 
back third of my career now. I'm in my mid fifties. And so I'm enjoying teaching people and sitting down going like, no, and having to explain the steps of production and the steps of the process where I think 10 years ago, more people knew that inherently. So it's not a bad thing. It's yeah. they know the people that I work with now know a ton more about stuff that I don't have any clue for. And, and that's because that's where the energy is. And so it's just more bringing some of the truth and the old school methodologies into the everyday life is challenging. And that's interesting. I think that's a, I think that's a great point because I think it's a system shift that we have, but it's also not anything new. I'm sure there's always been system shifts that we've had to have and the advent of the computer shifted one way, but so did the facts and other things as well. The level of communication today is when I remember the first time I had a Palm Pilot and I was able to transmit, I was in a Nordstrom men's meeting, I think, and I God, I forget where I was, but I, someone like on my Palm Pilot showed me how many pairs of it. I was in, in counting, filling pair shoes in like 2005 or something like that. And inventory came through on a Palm Pilot. And I thought to myself, oh my God, this is incredible. I'm showing it off. And, and so there's so much information and communication has improved so dramatically. And I work with people here and I work with people at Camuto that can create so many ways to share information um, efficiently that I can't do. And, yeah. um, and leaning into that and making sure that you're using the tools that are in front of us, CAD, uh, you know, our CAD well, systems are, well, I mean, are incredible. I mean, it, is, it is important that you have all that, but they are tools and you need a central point of truth and wisdom that can inform you and, and that, that guides the core of what we're trying to do as an industry. Um, and the successful people in the industry that I always talk to start with something like our core customer's email, She's a mom. She lives five miles from our store. She does this. She, like it is a meticulous look at what their target audience is and they develop the product around that. And then, yeah, sure. You, you ebb and flow product and you ebb and flow. You try to capture more market here or there, but it, it does seem like everything around that is important, but are, they are just ultimately tools to what we're trying to do as an industry. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that because there's a lot of bells and whistles. AI is the latest thing. And I, it's the same thing. I keep telling people like AI is going to be amazing, but it's just a tool. How do you, how do you use it? Because again, and we're using it, we're using it in development because it used to be, you'd go and, Hey, have a bunch of people sketch a bunch of shoes. Now with AI, you can be like, Hey, I want 15 different options on the following. And it populates in incredibly quickly. And to be honest with you, 90% of it's garbage, but the more specific you are on the input, the more, the more quality the output is. But again, the speed of it's crazy. Yeah. Look. Are we maximizing to the most? Absolutely not. There's a lot of potential there, but we're, we have the right people tapping into it, which is, yeah. uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to see because then it talks that, that thing I said about earlier about traditional process and blows it all up saying, wait a minute, that doesn't make any more sense, but show me how the, the, the marriage is in somewhere, somewhere in the, in between. Yeah. I think for AI, for the industry, the benefit right now is to lean into it to understand it. It's not to utilize it to its full ability because we don't know if we allocate capital to something, if it's going to give us the return we're looking for, it could be completely left field. And so I think it will fold into software that we're using, obviously like Microsoft's market leader and folding it into Excel and Word and things like that slowly. So it's this whole thing that, that Jim Isler always talks about, which is crawl, walk, run. And I think we're crawling right now. And we don't need to run. We don't need to, it will come, but don't, don't make the mistake of latching onto something and all of a sudden allocate a lot of money. And then it, it completely just clunker out on you. And I think that's, I think that's the challenge of it'll work. And we just need to be focused on where it can work and where it can't work. Um, but well, I think the really interesting about that process wise, just from us, and I know a lot of people are in the same boat that we are, we went away, like you had this rhythm of product development where, Hey. We, had, we sent product teams to Asia, to the factories and development rooms that would be there a month at a time. And really, and then when COVID happened, that all changed. And we went years without sending people there. They learned new systems on how to get things done. And now that we're back in Asia, like the timelines that they're back are right. a lot shorter. The communication that we have before they go is a lot different. So the, just the impact that had on the process is crazy. And then all these things we were talking about, whether it's AI or shared communications or improved communication has changed processes dramatically. And just from where we were in 2019 to where we are in 2024. Yeah. Let's talk retail. 
Because I think, and, and I think you've always said this really well, that, that the relationships matter, whether well, there's good times and tough times, right? So maybe just talk about how you engage with retailers and the retail environment as you see it right now. For what we're seeing, it's a little tough. There's a lot of product in the market. There's a lot of trying to figure out promotional activity to move it ahead of uh, spring and summer. How do you talk to retailers and what's kind of the pulse you're getting from retailers at this point? Um, number one, I think the thing that I tell my team is that the best thing about 2024 is that we're not copying the 22 numbers. Like 2022 was a bit of a Nirvana year because everyone came out of the pandemic and, and, and consumers really spent money. And yeah. so all last year we were chasing an uphill, we were battling an uphill fight, if you will. And so there's a certain just feeling that when you're looking at comp store decreases, multiple weeks running. There's a pale that comes over the conversation but when you're talking to retailers. And, and again, it's not reality because you have to look at things on a big picture, but it just, it paints the situation negatively. And so now we're, we're, I've had three emails this morning saying I'm out of product and I don't have enough, like we're selling out of spring transitional goods, which I'm bummed about it because I'd love to satisfy those customers that want to replenish something. But I'm happy about it because we haven't been in that game where we're replenishing and seeing success in eight, again, in the first eight months I was here, seven, six, seven months that I was here. It's a good shift yeah. um, that we're starting to see that. And then to answer your question, that makes communication with retailers a lot easier saying, hey, how can we grow this business? How can we um, effectively manage business rather than managing it? Hey, how do we mitigate the problems that we're having? So look, and, and again, you have good seasons, you have bad seasons, you have good years, you have bad years. I try to stay consistent with my approach. I don't try to get too emotional. I try to, to be a good partner in good years and a, a great partner in bad years. And uh, that's one thing that when I left H.H. Brown in 2018, I kicked some tires on some different opportunities outside of the footwear industry. And four or five months later, when the failing opportunity came back, it was a really cathartic way because this is where I built my careers, held my career, and this is where I want to be. And I didn't want to be in, I was a consultant for an equity fund. I was, I did some stuff that was fun. It was different, enjoyed parts of it, but I'm a footwear guy. Yeah. I'm a, I started, as you said, I started my career in Asia with Nike. So I'm a bit of a shoe dog. I've always enjoyed shoes. I enjoy, I, I find myself looking at people's feet when I was in church as a kid. And so I've always liked, I've always liked shoes. I don't know why. So, and that's talking about relationships with people, whether it's buyers or divisionals or different people in the industry, I really enjoy those relationships. And I, tr I try to be a stable, consistent person in those relationships. I know you're traveling to Asia soon. Is that the first time back in a while to Asia or how often do you make it over to look at product? Um, we have a sourcing partner in Taiwan. So I went to Taiwan, Cobra, I think. This is my first trip back. We're going to go see some factories in China. So I haven't been in China in a bit. It'll be my first trip to China into develop into the, into sample rooms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm going, I'm, I'm missing the executive summit. Sadly, I'm sorry. I'm going to miss you there. Cause like, uh, an event not to miss. When you walked back in to Berkshire Hathaway, did they play the welcome back Connor theme music? That's the big question I have right here. Did they, did they? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, I, I will tell you that was one of the more satisfying experiences of my career. The people in the, the people here in the office that I spent 15 years raising my kids with and coming back into the office and seeing them again after we stayed, I stayed in touch. I'd come in every six months, every year just to say hello, but being a part of their lives again has been one of the most rewarding experiences of the last eight months. And so. Okay. Again, you spend time with each other. You become friends. You become, I think the term work family is a little overused, but you become close. And so I'm really happy to be back with folks like Bob Luisi and Sharon Jones, who I know Sharon well, yeah. and probably not because there's a bunch of people here that I respect yeah. tremendously and can't love being back working with on a daily yeah. basis. Is it hard not working with me on a daily basis? It must be. It you, must be. Uh, I will tell you this. You had to be on your A game when, when you were calling you, cause you, you think and move at a very quick pace. And you always had to, you, had, you always had to stay one step ahead. Cause you knew you were going to be challenged when you got on the phone call with Andy Bulk. And I've enjoyed this conversation. It's not often we get on and have no notes and just get to cover things. And I think it's really important to hear people's shoe stories because we just hearing your perspectives about how you've grown and how you change approach things like there's cool, right? 
there's core knowledge about how we want to operate and treat people and relationships. And then there's that, that extra added business acumen that we pick up along the way in different perches in different areas. It's fun to have you back at Berkshire Hathaway and, and having built even a better relationship, uh, when you were running Fannie and, and then coming into FTR and then able to get it before you went to DPI. So that was always a ton of fun, um, and meaningful work too. I think people they know we're an association they may not see behind the curtain of what we're really trying to do and i hope you i think you were able to see but we really actually care and we were really trying yeah. to be purpose-driven building community for the industry and then that's why we make decisions around that yeah I, I still get to be involved a little bit because sandy and has become the executive director of this fashion footwear charitable foundation yeah is again it was the fanny shoes on sales for so many years did so much good for breast cancer research and Sandy and Susan Itzkowitz and, and, and Jill Hatton and myself and Sarah Lubis and Matt and, um, Carrie Rubin and I'm Sandra Collins on the board and Kathy Forsyth on the board. And I'm probably forgetting people, but, uh, a Farrell Morris is on the board. Um, mm -hmm. and so built, rebuilding that board, rebuilding that effort has been really rewarding again. Um, uh, and I, I still get to deal with Matt and Sandy quite a bit on the charitable foundation. So that's been a lot of, that's been, it hasn't been fun. It's been rewarding Been super yeah. rewarding. Sandy and I got to go with Susan and Sarah and give a check to the doctors at Will Cornell a couple of weeks ago. Those are just moments that are just so fulfilling. And so yeah. hey, thank you to the industry that we represent that we're in and hear the stories about the work that our funds are, that our, that our monies are funding. It's incredibly rewarding. There's little things like that that make, that I'm really fortunate that I had that time with Fanny because it wasn't for that. I probably, I wouldn't be, be as involved in the charitable foundation, mm -hmm. which is again, some, I take more pride in that than I do most things. Yeah. As we wrap up 2024, we optimistic, we feeling good. You had mentioned earlier, like comping it's last year. I know it's a tough environment, but what else can we be but optimistic? I always, Cliff Sifford always said as a retailer, I'm always optimistic. Which I think I, they get any, but what do you think? hundred percent agree. Look, we've got, as I said earlier, we've got some good in indicators. I think being in March 6th or March, whatever it is that I think we're going to have a good spring. Our selling has been good for fall. Our inventory levels are in such a healthier spot across. I know it with internally, but I know across the industry, reading Gary's reports and listening to you guys. And that's just going to, that's just going to impact more health, healthy business. And so, yeah, I'm optimistic that we're going to have a banner year. No, I don't think anyone's going to, I don't think anyone's sitting there going, this is going to be the year that we're going to boom. Right. But I'm really confident that we're going to have a successful year, a much more yeah. efficient year. And I'm optimistic. And then I have leading my team. I'm optimistic to them saying, let's, we got a lot of work to do. Got to get our, our noses to the grindstone. But yeah, definitely. I think 24 is going to be a, we're to look back at 24 is going to be better than 23. There you go. Great folks, John, thanks for coming on. I encourage folks, if you're in if you're in New York for June Fanny to stop by the board and brand group in Midtown. I guess it's Midtown, isn't it? Technically. Yeah. We're 40th and Broadway. Yeah. Yep. We're, we're right in the, the heart of, of Times Square. Yep. You can stop by. They got good coffee uh, at the showroom there. Just to we, do. we have an espresso machine. It's nice. It's very nice. It's very nice. But as always, John, thank you so much for joining us and sharing a little bit about your journey and then your how you feel the industry's going, the pulse of it, uh, the shifts and changes that we see. Um, as always, appreciate you coming on and, and the leadership role that you take with some of the industry groups that are out there. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thanks so much. And okay, I'm going to have a last good couple of days without Matt. <laughs> exactly. Folks, it's a Shoe and Show. Thanks for listening. As always, shoeandshow.com is the full catalog. Every Monday, new episode comes out. Please listen. If you have suggestions on guests or topic, drop us a line. This is the Footwear Industry Podcast. We try to talk about things that are meaningful to you, helping shape your business strategies, as well as get a picture of where our industry is and where it's headed. So thanks for listening. And again, thanks for John for coming on. A great friend of mine. It's always fun to chat. Until next time, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.